right now not much oil is being produced in the world. Many doubt production will be restored next year to the pre-pandemic level. At the same time, we have a global energy crisis with the sharp rise in gas and coal prices. As energy demands grow, the low production won't be able to meet the demand, which means prices continue to rise. So how did this happen? In the spring of 2020, oil prices plummeted due to the pandemic. Remember, airplanes were grounded, cities were under lockdown, and there was an enormous drop in fuel demand. That's why the oil supply at that time was 20% higher than the demand. Needless to say, members of OPEC agreed to reduce their oil production by a record amount, almost 10 million barrels per day, which is about 10% of world production. This was the OPEC plus deal. The U.S. and other countries that aren't normally part of OPEC also cut production. So all in all, this meant a reduction of some 15 million barrels per day, or more than 15% of the world's oil production. Prices quickly rose to $40 to $45 per barrel. Exporters suffered huge losses, even at relatively high prices. That's because the cut in production cost them tens of billions of dollars. The first tough pandemic lockdowns helped the global economy to start recovering. So, exporters started to increase production again. They were cautious. They didn't want to restore production fully or too quickly. Otherwise, that would bring a drop in price. The pandemic is still ongoing, and if any country with a large economy, let's say China, for example, were to enforce yet another new lockdown, that would mean demand will plummet again. So you can see how the situation has been quite volatile. Initially, analysts thought that even a slow increase in production by the OPEC members would make supply exceed demand for January 2022, and therefore lead to a drop in prices. They believe this because U.S. companies increased offshore oil production to pre-pandemic levels a few months ago. Before the pandemic, the U.S. production level led to an oil surplus on the world market. But this initial forecast of an excess of supply turned out to be wrong. This summer, it became clear that a huge additional demand for oil could emerge in the world in the upcoming months. For the first time in decades, the price of natural gas in Europe and Asia exceeded the price of oil in terms of energy release. So that's why analysts believe they'll see significant increase in oil demand from 750,000 to 2 million barrels per day. This summer, it also became evident that most of the OPEC Plus members couldn't increase production even to the quotas that they'd agreed upon. At the same time, oil demand was growing much faster than previously forecasted. In September 2021, the OPEC Plus members increased production faster than they initially agreed to, but they still couldn't keep up with the demand. Only Russia and Iraq are producing more oil than their quotas allow. The problem is, many of the oil exporting countries don't have enough investment to return to previous production levels. OPEC leadership denies this, of course. Some people speculate that maybe they're just not reinvesting in oil production at pre-pandemic levels since the global economy is transitioning to green energy. They point to the fact that even the largest private oil companies in the world have been investing in renewable energy in addition to future oil expansion. Recently, British Petroleum has been gambling big on a fast transition from oil to renewables. That's because all major oil players are facing lots of pressure from government regulators and investors to develop cleaner energy and divest from fossil fuels since it's the primary source of greenhouse gas emissions that cause global warming. So BP has been gambling to transition faster than its peers. BP proposed to cut oil production by 40% or about a million barrels a day. That's equal to the United Kingdom's entire daily output in 2019. In addition, BP is boosting capacity to generate electricity from renewable resources equivalent to the power made by 50 U.S. nuclear plants. Going back to rising gasoline prices, some people speculate that some oil exporting countries aren't quick to return to previous investment level in new oil production projects because of green energy. They say the current oil situation is an opportunity to transition more quickly to green energy and abandon oil. But unfortunately, it's not all that simple. The chief planner of the International Energy Agency, which is responsible for green energy transition, said that the transition could become quite messy. The IEA's new version of the energy transition plan shows a noble yet ambitious goal to achieve zero greenhouse gas by 2050. This will limit climate change to 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. They believe that only the speed of transition will allow avoiding catastrophic consequences for the climate, population, and economy. Let's talk about electrification. A few years ago, Stanford economists projected that EVs will kill the global oil industry by 2030. If the world economy really starts abandoning fossil fuels at the speed that politicians are planning, then some people think we'll reach the peak of oil consumption sooner than later, which after that point, oil demand will only go down. Would it surprise you to hear that gas giants BP and Shell acquired EV charging companies? They bought them with chump change to diversify their holdings. But it just goes to show that the oil industry acknowledges the electric future 
future. But the fact is that it'll probably take a bit longer than that before the EV uptake destroys oil demand. Frankly, EVs have a way to go before it can challenge the internal combustion engine industry and subsequently the oil industry to a significant degree. Here's why. Last year, light plug-in and fuel cell cars plus electric city buses and two-wheelers displaced some 370,000 barrels per day. Expert estimate that number will grow to 1.5 million barrels per day by 2025. That's 400%. You might think that sounds like an insanely huge number. The fact is, that would be just 1.4% of the world's total oil demand. So it's just a tiny dent. And that's why oil investors aren't losing sleep over it yet. Here's another interesting metric. Last year, just 2.7% of cars sold their EVs. Experts believe it'll grow to 31% by 2040. So the EV is an upward trend, and its long-term outlook is bright. But nevertheless, it's still decades away. If governments want to accelerate the EV revolution, they need to create more incentives for consumers to buy EVs and create more subsidies to speed up the infrastructure growth and battery innovations. Recently, Biden administration has proposed investing heavily on EV infrastructure. The UK previously had plans to ban sales of gasoline and diesel cars after 2040. But last year, Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced they're moving up the deadline to 2030. Just consider what major car companies are doing right now. General Motors pledged to focus on electric cars and be fully electric by 2035. Jaguar plans for their cars to be fully battery electric by 2030. Land Rover projects their cars to be 60% BEV by that time. Ford announced that all their cars in Europe will be EV by 2026. This fuels a lot of hope for the EV sector. Every revolution and every war is about chaos. And that's what we're seeing. Advances are being made on both sides. It's hard to discern what the real turning point will be and when. You have people with differing views and projects. And the only common thing we share is just knowing the storm is brewing. Let's talk about how the oil and gas lobbyists are reacting. So the U.S. Senate passed a budget resolution in August for a $3.5 trillion budget reconciliation package. But then there's the American Petroleum Institute and you also have the American Gas Association. They're two of the most powerful oil and gas lobbies in America. Since that budget resolution, API and AGA have been flooding Facebook with targeted ads that, that oppose climate and initiatives. API alone sent $423,000 on Facebook ads. And these ads have been viewed some 21 million times. Their average ad spend is a bit shy of $11,000 a day, which of course is peanut money for them. AGA has been spending too. They spent $18,000 on Facebook ads with the goal of moving people to contact their members of Congress and vote no to higher energy costs and against the energy tax. In the U.S., unleaded gasoline usually comes in three grades. Normally we have 87 for basic or regular, 80 for plus or mid grade and 93 for premium. But what is octane rating and what does it mean? Octane rating refers to how resistant the fuel is to combustion by pressure. The higher the octane rating, the more compression the fuel can withstand before it ignites. Higher octane fuels are often required or recommended for engines that use a higher compression ratio and or use supercharging or turbocharging to force more air into the engine. Increasing pressure in the cylinder allows an engine to extract more mechanical energy from a given air fuel mixture, but requires higher octane fuel to keep the mixture from pre-detonating. Octane rating does not relate directly to the power output. It has nothing to do with the energy contained per liter or per kilogram of fuel. Fuels with a higher octane rating are used in higher compression engines that potentially yield higher power. But such higher power comes from higher compression of the engine, not necessarily from the gasoline. Do you know why the octane numbers of gas stations in the U.S. differ from those in Europe? Europe has 95 and 99. Does this mean that Europe uses higher octane? No, because in the U.S., gas stations use pump octane number or PON, but Europe uses RON which means research octane number. It's just a matter of definition. So the American 89 octane, or mid-grade, is the same as the European 95 octane. And the American 93, or premium grade, is the same or similar to the European 99. In 1921, an English engineer, Harry Ricardo, discovered that the more iso-octane in the fuel, the more resistance it was to detonation. He developed a scale to measure detonation resistance. Gasoline made up of 100% iso-octane was 
given an octane rating of 100. Harry's work ultimately led to the general use of octane ratings. There are a lot of myths about octane, so answer true or false. The different octane levels means different energy content. Different octanes burn fuel hotter or colder or faster or slower. Different octanes burn fuel cleaner and more fully. If you answered yes to any of these myths, then unfortunately you were wrong because one, the different octane levels all contain the same energy content. Two, they also all burn the same temperature at the same speed. Three, a clean or complete fuel burn depends not on the octane, but mainly on the air fuel ratio in your car's combustion chamber. So let's break it down. What happens if your car requires high octane gas, but you fill it with low octane instead? Nowadays, modern cars have electronic control units, ECUs, that can adjust engine timing and performance to operate even with lower octane fuel. So your car will drive, but engine power and fuel economy will still suffer. Frequent use of fuel with octane lower than what your car needs can lead to poor engine performance and eventually damage both the engine and the emission control system. Here's why. Ignore the ECU for a minute. In general, using lower octane gas in a high octane gas car means that under high pressure, gasoline will ignite spontaneously and earlier than it should. And what is called detonation, that is thermal shock, will occur. This is a spontaneous, uncontrolled ignition of fuel in the engine. Detonation leads to a sharp rise in temperature and even to a possible explosion. Will your engine survive the detonation? And how do you know if or when it's happening? Simple, you hear a knock sound from the engine when the detonation occurs. This knock is created by pressure waves that occur during the rapid combustion of the mixture and get reflected from the walls of the cylinder and piston. This reduces the engine power and accelerates the wear inside. So if detonation waves occur, the engine can be damaged or destroyed. That's how gasoline with a lower octane rating can damage the engine pistons if you regularly use it in a car that requires high octane. What about the opposite scenario? Let's say your car maker requires regular unleaded gas, but you upgrade with mid-grade or premium. Will this affect fuel economy or engine performance? It depends on your driving conditions. For example, in most cars, higher octane fuel can improve performance in gas mileage and it can also reduce carbon dioxide, CO2, emissions during severe duty operation. Like if you're towing a trailer or carrying a heavy load, especially in hot weather. But under normal driving conditions, you'll probably get little to no benefit in fuel economy or engine performance. In that scenario, you have to ask yourself, why pay more for premium gas? So, is there a difference between what your car maker requires versus what they recommend? Yes, there is a difference. In general, if your vehicle requires mid-grade or premium fuel, then higher octane fuel is worth the extra cost. If your owner's manual says your car doesn't require premium fuel, but says that your vehicle will run better on higher octane fuel, in other words, it's recommended but not required, well, then it's really up to you. The cost increase is typically higher than the fuel savings. But some drivers value lower CO2 emissions and lower petroleum usage by even a small amount. And for those drivers, this is more important to them than cost. In conclusion, what fuels should you use for your car? At minimum, use the fuel grade required by the original car manufacturer. Where can you find that information? It's always written in your car manual. If you lost your manual, you can check either the fuel door, because it's usually written there. Or if it's not there, it's probably on the fuel cap. Or if it's not there, check the fuel gauge on your dashboard. Here's a quick cheat sheet on how gasoline works in your car. So you get to the pump, you fuel your car. The gas goes straight to the gas tank. Well, inside the tank is a fuel pump. It pumps the gas into your car's fuel line. The fuel filter filters out debris in the gas. Next, the fuel injector sprays gas into the piston cylinder. The gas gets processed in the engine, typically in a four-stroke cycle. First, air gets sucked into the cylinder. The air and fuel mix as the piston moves downward in the cylinder. As the piston moves back up, it compresses the air and fuel mixture. Then the spark plug ignites the compressed air and fuel. This causes a combustion reaction. The liquid gas gets converted into exhaust gas, which forces the piston back down. The exhaust valves open. The exhaust gases leave the cylinder, travel through the exhaust pipe, through the catalytic converter, which reduces the pollutants into less toxic substances, like carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water and then the gas is passed through the muffler and into the air. Then there's gas additives. They can work to increase the octane rating of gas, inhibit corrosion, lubricate, and allow higher compression ratio for greater efficiency and power. However, some additives are harmful and are regulated or banned in some countries. Oftentimes, gas retailers treat the gas they buy with specific additives. 
Ever hear of top tier detergent gasoline? In 2004, top tier gasoline was developed to go beyond the minimum standard for detergent additives to better protect engines from carbon buildup and deposits on the intake valves. Nowadays, engines have become far more precise, operating under tighter tolerances and higher compression ratios with cleaner emissions and improved fuel economy. And that's why many big automakers, Audi, BMW, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, General Motors, Honda, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota, and Volkswagens support top-tier gas. Top-tier fuel must maintain levels of detergent additives that result in a higher standard of engine cleanliness and performance as compared to the EPA minimum requirement. Also, it can't contain metal additives. Let's talk about ethanol. Ethanol is an alternative alcohol fuel. It's made from plant materials like corn and sugar. In fact, did you know that much of the corn grown in the U.S. isn't eaten, popped, or creamed? Some of it is turned into ethanol. It's added to gasoline because it's a cost-effective way to raise the octane rating of gas. Also, ethanol burns cleanly, so it's also a way to help reduce emissions. Ethanol can be burned in a gasoline engine, but it's less than ideal compared to gasoline. Reason is, it has less chemical energy than diesel or regular gasoline. But since ethanol comes from renewable sources, it makes a lot of sense to use as much of it as we can. Ever see the badge for E85 and wonder what that is? E85 is a blend of 85% ethanol and 15% gasoline. It's designed for use in flex fuel vehicles, which can use both gasoline or a mixture of gasoline and ethanol. Well, what happens if you actually put E85 in a non flex fuel vehicle. Well, your car may run poorly and a check engine light might turn on, but it shouldn't cause major damage to your car. Just be sure to add regular gasoline to the tank when you can to further dilute the ethanol. While 85% ethanol is a bit high use for normal gasoline cars, a more conservative ratio can help stretch gasoline supplies and reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. In fact, that's why at most regular gas stations these days, you might notice a pump with a sticker that says something like, may contain up to 10% ethanol, or a blue pump with a blend of 25%, 30%, or 35% ethanol. These fuels work just fine in most modern cars built after 2002, and that's why we see a bit of ethanol in virtually all gasoline nowadays. You should check your owner's manual or speak to one of the service advisors if you're unsure. If you're circling around the block to find the cheapest gas station, it can get very irritating. But did you know that there are apps you can download on your smartphone that help you find the cheapest gas stations near you? Apps like like Gas Buddy, Waze, and Gas Guru. They say sometimes it can end up saving you up to 30 cents a gallon. The reason is, apps like these constantly update gas prices in real time. You can even get notifications on your phone for deals. With rising gas pricing, most people are starting to use these types of apps. In fact, on March 7th, there was so much user traffic on Gas Buddy that it was inaccessible on and off that entire day. And another app, Gas Guru, gives you information straight from the order oil price information service. It even lets you search by fuel grade and amenities too. Now, if you're on the road and don't care to download any of these apps, here's a good rule of thumb. Avoid gas stations just off the highway exit or in the middle of a major city. Gas stations located in those areas generally have higher prices. It's also a great idea to consider reward cards. For example, Gas Buddy offers a free gas card that can save you up to 25 cents a gallon at most gas stations across the country. Retailers like Walmart, Kroger, Safeway, Costco, BJ's and Sam's Clubs also have competitive fuel rewards programs and many gas stations often offer discount for cash payments as opposed to credit card payments. Wondering what day of the week is best for pumping gas? Turns out it's Monday. Gas Buddy did a study where they discovered that Mondays usually have the cheapest prices in most U.S. states. On the other hand, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays generally mean higher prices. There are other practical tips to help you save money on gas. Let's start with the easiest one. First off, it's best to check for peak traffic hours in your area before you set off on the road. The heavier the traffic, the longer you'll sit in it. On the other hand, if you spend less time idling in traffic, you'll waste less gas too. Speaking of idling, just don't do it. At least try not to. If you need to wait for more than one minute, it's best to turn off your engine if it's safe to. Newer vehicles now have engines that automatically stop when the car idles for a certain period of time. Did you know that idling can cost you up to half 
a gallon of gas per hour. Waiting at a red light takes 45 to 120 seconds. Starting your car only requires about 10 seconds of gas. Even if it's cold outside, don't idle your car for long periods of time to try to warm up your car. All it does is waste fuel. Now, if you're one of those drivers who loves to speed from point A to point B, I've got some advice for you. Just slow down. Slowing down and driving at the speed limit reduces aerodynamic drag. The lower the drag, the higher the fuel economy. Fuel economy starts to drop significantly when you speed above 50 miles per hour. Also, when you accelerate, gradually ease up on the brake. When your brake suddenly or accelerate quickly, car eats up more gas. That's why coasting down a hill to a red light is recommended. Cruise control is also a great option to help you maintain the best speed and save fuel when the road is flat. Here's one that might be new to you. Don't wait until spring cleaning to clean out your car. Carrying extra cargo in your car adds weight to the vehicle. I'm talking about things like sand or salt bags for removing ice. The more weight your car has, the more gas it needs to get moving. Losing an extra 100 pounds from your vehicle can improve your gas mileage by 1%. That's based on the percentage of extra weight relative to your vehicle's weight. Also, things like cargo containers or bike racks on a roof increase the vehicle's wind resistance. This means that the engine has to work harder to maintain its speed. In fact, this aerodynamic drag can increase fuel consumption by up to a whopping 20% on the highway. So if you don't use those features regularly, just remove them for your daily commute. Also, make sure your tires are properly inflated. Low tire pressure reduces fuel efficiency. Not only that, but it also wears your tires out quickly. Tires lose pressure over time. You can't avoid it. That's why you should check the pressure at least once a month. Now, if you ever see your car's check engine light come on, take it to a repair shop as soon as possible or get your code reader if you own one and see what it is. Engine issues can cause you to burn up to 25% more fuel than you normally should. On the other hand, if you regularly service your car, then you're helping your engine run at its best. In fact, Properly maintaining your car might cost you in the short term, but it will also improve your gas mods by some 4%. Not to mention extend the overall performance and lifespan of your engine. And fixing a serious maintenance problem, like a faulty oxygen sensor, can improve your mileage by up to 40%. If you want to know how often you should get a tune-up, just check your car's manual. It depends on your car's age and model. For newer cars, an inspection is generally recommended every 20 to 30,000 miles. Also, check the fuel octane that's appropriate for your vehicle. Some people believe the myth that putting premium high octane fuel will help your cars be more fuel efficient, but that isn't necessarily true. Many cars are actually designed to use regular low octane fuel, so adding higher octane fuel won't help your engine, but only hurt your wallet. One last tip for the day. This one's about air conditioning since gas prices are expected to remain high through the summer. Some people believe that in hot weather you should use AC. The reasoning is that modern air conditionings create less drags than if you were to drive with the windows rolled down. But there are others that say driving with your windows rolled down will save you fuel. Here's the thing. The correct answer isn't absolutely either of the two. Studies show it's best to drive with the windows rolled down if you're driving at speeds less than 40 miles an hour. But if you're driving faster than that, then it's more fuel efficient to drive with the AC turned on and the windows rolled up. And of course, if you have flexibility, the best is to drive during cooler parts of the day if you can. That's because cooler, denser air can boost power and mileage, and your air conditioner won't have to turn itself on as often when it's not 100 degrees outside. Let's talk about what's happening right now. On March 6th, the average price of gas in the U.S. broke $4 a gallon. This was the first time it happened in almost 14 years. We're talking an increase of nearly 50% from a year ago. The next day, the national average was $4.10 a gallon, breaking an all-time record high. And that's not even taking inflation into account. The following day, it hit $4.17. That was an increase of about 55 cents since the week prior. Nowadays, filling up a small car can cost you 60 bucks, and a crossover can easily break $80. No wonder people are anxious about the future, and some experts expect this upward trend to continue in the months to come. Crude is petroleum gas in its national state before it gets refined. Even before the U.S. ban, many Western energy companies moved to cut ties with Russian limit imports. I'm talking about companies like Exxon Mobil and BP. Shell purchased a shipment of Russian oil at the beginning of March, and then they apologized two days later after an international criticism of their action. Then they promised to stop any further purchases of Russian energy supplies. Preliminary data from the U.S. Energy Department showed more interesting findings. They found that imports of Russian crude oil dropped down to zero in the last week of February. So, how much does the U.S. rely on Russia for oil anyway? Well, Russia accounts for almost 10% of the world's oil supply. 
But you might be surprised to learn that Russia isn't the world's largest oil producer. And it isn't Saudi Arabia either. Believe it or not, actually, it's the United States. But the U.S. is also the world's biggest oil consumer. We can't meet the demand in our country only with U.S. sourced crude oil. We need other countries to help too. And one of them has been Russia. At least it was. Last year in 2021, the U.S. imported 245 million barrels of oil from Russia. That's about 8% of all U.S. oil imports. That's less than what the U.S gets from Canada or Mexico, but more than we imported from Saudi Arabia. Biden explained it would be understandable that prices would rise, but he did caution the U.S. energy industry against excessive price increases and exploitation of consumers. Even so, that doesn't mean the industry will listen. Now, that's not to say that the U.S. economy can't fully handle higher gas prices. It can, but it will bring some challenges. There's just no way around that. Remember, gas prices were soaring even before the ban officially started, and the major reason for that was because of the looming possibility of a U.S. ban on Russian oil imports. Only now it's a reality. Even experts say they'd never seen this type of situation before it's with this level of uncertainty. In 2008, gas prices broke a record when it averaged $4.10 a gallon. When you take inflation into account, that comes to about $5.24 per gallon. Soaring prices stuck around for weeks, but here's the difference. The projections for high gas prices right now is that this time it'll stick around for months. Just how high are we talking about? As of the making of this video, experts are saying that we're headed towards national average of $4.50 a gallon. Some experts believe that this ban on Russian oil imports can even shoot an average over $5. In February, oil was selling for about $90 a barrel. Now that price is $130 a barrel. Energy analysts have warned that prices could rise as high as $160 or even $200 a barrel in the near future. This is only if sanctions continue and we continue to boycott Russian crude oil. Because of the U.S. ban on Russian gas and oil imports, the U.S. is considering other sources. For example, senior U.S. officials traveled to Venezuela recently to discuss the possibility of easing up oil sanctions over there. Time will tell as to whether the alternative sources will work or not. For now, the best we can do is save up on gas in any way we can and buckle up for rising prices in the months to come. But now, you tell me, how high do you think gas prices will be? Whether it be a tipping point or threshold where you'll stop driving and take public transportation instead, or maybe consider getting an electric vehicle. Do you have any other tips or tricks to save at the pump? Please share your experience by commenting below. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Thanks for your support.